Okay, this is Physical Science. We are in week 2-5, starting here on Monday, December 7th. Um, we're in Chapter 18. The video that you're on is uh, PS25A blade. PS25A blade. Okay, chapter 18, starting page 552, Chemical Bonds. The assignment, folks, is always to read the chapter. There's good stuff in there. It's not, shouldn't be just totally redundant to, to lecture over. It should be a little bit different. The readings is really a good place to get information. Okay, so... What's going on with chemical bonds? When elements get put together, you can get a chemical reaction to happen. You may see, what are some indicators? Ah, you can see effervescence, you could see precipitate, you could see color change, you could see energy being given off or absorbed in some form like heat or electricity or light. These are things we discussed. One of three outcomes will happen when you put elements from the periodic table together. I'll show you one here since I know this is up here. <coughs> You'll either get two metals to bond and get an alloy like you did with the bronze bell, or you'll get a metal combined with a non-metal and get some sort of a salt and ionic compound. Or you'll get two non-metals to combine, and you'll end up with a molecule. Now, a lot of times people think, or maybe even told, that atoms make molecules. Yeah, they do only when you have two non-metals combined. That doesn't happen when you have two metals making an alloy, and it doesn't happen when you have a metal and a non-metal getting together and making a salt. An ionic compound. So we could have metallic bonds holding together metal atoms in an alloy. We could have ionic bonds holding metal ions and non-metal ions together in a salt. Or we could have covalent bonds holding molecules made of non-metal atoms together. Let me try that again. I'm not sure I said it right. We could have covalent bonds holding molecules made of non-metal atoms together. Those are three different outcomes. And when that happens and you have a reaction, you're going to end up with a chemical formula, which shows what elements are there and the number of atoms in each element to make a unit of that compound. That unit could be a, a ratio of salt ions, ions and salt, or it could be molecules. You're not going to have that thing with metals. Because with metals and alloys, you don't have fixed ratios. They, they vary depending on where you're at in the crystal. It's a homogeneous mixture. Let's consider sulfuric acid. That's probably given as an example in the book. H2SO4. Now, this is a molecule. It's made of nonmetals. Hydrogen's a nonmetal, even though it's on this side. Sulfur's a nonmetal. Oxygen's a nonmetal. This chemical formula, these numbers are called subscripts. Sub as in submarine, as in below, script below, script as in writing. So these numbers are written below. They count atoms or polyatomic ions. How many hydrogen atoms are in sulfuric acid? Two. How many sulfur atoms? There's not a number. There's not a number. That number is one. And there are four oxygen atoms. That's what that means. It actually looks something like this. Two minus charge, and around it somewhere a hydrogen and a hydrogen. Something like that. Two hydrogen atoms, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms around here.
Okay, let's consider magnesium hydroxide. Here's your subscript. There's the OH in parentheses this time. What's that mean? Well, let's look at magnesium. How many does that contain? Anywhere you don't see a number, there's a one. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there. It's got one magnesium ion. It's kind of like this. Two hydroxide ions and one magnesium ion right there. Magnesium hydroxide. How many oxygen atoms? One times two is two times one is still two. There's one, there's one. How many hydro hydrogen atoms? One, because if you don't have a number, it's one. One times two is two. Two times one is still two. There's one, there's one. So it's two hydrogen atoms. Okay, you will be asked about ionic bonds and covalent bonds and metallic bonds, but metallic bonds aren't as big of a deal. So you will be asked about them. So you need to know this information, which is a restatement of what I did back here. Talking about this again. This right here. Notice the capital letters, arrows, exclamation points, kind of important. Ionic bonds happen when electrons are given by a nonmetal atom and taken by, or sorry, given by a metal atom and taken by a nonmetal atom. When you're done, you get a salt, an ionic solid. Covalent bonds happen when electrons are shared. See the highlighting? Ionic, give and take. Covalent, shared. This occurs between two nonmetals up in that corner. Or maybe hydrogen in one of those in that corner. When you're done, you get molecules. That's the only time you get molecules. And the other kind of bond is metallic bonding. This was made between two metals on this side, resulting in an alloy like bronze or brass. Okay, let's show how sodium loses one electron and chlorine gains one electron. We looked at this already. Remember, if sodium's sitting here on the left-hand side of the periodic table, and it's got one valence electron, and it wants to get to eight, it's not going to be able to get rid of seven. But it can get rid of this whole layer and have eight below it. Chlorine's over there on the right side in the seventh family, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, wanting one more, and here it is. So this electron will jump over here. Chlorine will then own that ion. It'll have a charge of minus because it's going to have an extra electron. Sodium will have a charge of plus because it'll be short by an electron. And bam, you end up with the sodium ion plus one, chloride ion minus one. They're negative or they're oppositely charged, so they're going to stick because the opposite electrical charges attract. Okay, now this is a little different. You've got oxygen and hydrogen in hydrogen. To make water. Why is it H2O? Because they share. If you look at oxygen in that periodic table, it is in this family. The sixth one. It's right here between nitrogen and fluorine and above sulfur. It has six valence electrons, needs two to get to the eight that we all want. So it's sitting here in blue with one, two, three, four, five, six. Hydrogen's all the way over there on the left with one. The only way hydrogen can get the two it wants, because when you do a molecule, when you do an atom, that first layer has two, and then all the layers after that are eight. 
Don't worry about why at this point. But the only way hydrogen can get its two is if it parts here and it shares with oxygen. The only way oxygen or this hydrogen can get its two is if it parts here and it shares these. The only way oxygen can get its eight is if it has this one, two, three, four, five, six, and it shares that one and that one. So as long as they stick together and share, everybody has the electrons they need. And that's what you get with a covalent bond. Section review. Number one. Explain why some elements are stable on the other, their own while the others are more stable on compounds. Well, which ones are stable on their own? The ones that have already got eight. So all of these are stable on their own because they already have eight electrons. Everybody else is either going to try to give electrons away, or if they're over here, they're going to try to take electrons, or maybe share if they're in this part of the table. So, if an element has a full outer energy level, like neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, helium, they don't want to react. If an element does not have a full outer energy level, that's everything but the noble gases, it will form a compound by gaining, losing, or sharing electrons with other atoms in order to have a full outer energy level. Everybody's trying to get eight. That's the magic number. Number two, compare and contrast the properties of potassium and iodine with the compound Ki. Okay, potassium tries to give away, well, first of all, potassium's over here on the left. Here, let's take a look at this. Potassium's right below lithium. Well, it's two positions below lithium. And what was the other one? Iodine, it's over here. So iodine's got seven, valence electron's trying to take one. Potassium's got one, valence electron is trying to get rid of. Iodine is a dark solid that forms a purple gas when it's heated. You put these two together, and potassium iodide is a solid white salt. As a matter of fact, there's a product called no salt. If you know somebody that's got a heart condition, they may use no salt or one, I, I forget what the blend is of 50 50, but there's a no salt, and it's this one. Uh, that's what that looks like. Number three. Identify what the electron dot diagram tells you about the bonding. What it's going to tell you is how many electrons it's got and whether or not it's likely to take some or give some, give them away. The electron dot diagram of an element tells you how many electrons are in its outer energy level. That's how many it has right up here. How many it's got or how many it has around it. If the outer energy is full, it is stable. That would be the noble gases. Otherwise, it's likely to form bonds to gain stability. Number four, why are, explain why electric forces are essential to forming compounds. The electric forces are the forces that cause compounds to form because they are forces between two oppositely charged electrons and protons that hold molecules and ionic compounds together. So if it wasn't for negative electrons and positive protons, you wouldn't form molecules from atoms sticking together. Or you also wouldn't form salts where the positives and negatives were sticking together. Why does chemical bonding form? Number five, describe why chemical bonding forms, occurs. Basically, because you're trying to get, they're all trying to get eight valence electrons. Give two examples how bonds can form. I already gave you two. 
Bonds form because they result in a more stable arrangement of electrons. Eight. Bonds can form either by two atoms sharing electrons, that's a covalent bond, or one atom gaining an electron and the other atom in a bond losing an electron. That's called ionic bonding, to get eight. Not listed here. And we're really probably not going to talk about it much more this chapter. Not listed here is metallic bonding. It's, we don't have to count things going on with it. Number six. The label on a box of cleanser states that it contains CH3COOH. That's acetic acid. It's vinegar. Well, it's the active ingredient of vinegar. What elements are in this compound and how many elements of each can be found in a unit of CH3COOH? You've got hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And there's four hydrogen and two carbon and two oxygen atoms. Four hydrogen, two carbon, and two oxygen. Use percentages, number seven. Given that the molecular mass of magnesium hydroxide is 58.32, and the atomic mass of oxygen is 15.999. What percentage of this compound is oxygen? By mass. Percent by mass. You've got two of those 15.999s, which comes out to be 31.998. So how do you do percent with that? You divide. What do you divide? 31.998. By the total of 58.32 and you get the answer. You need to use a calculator to do that. I don't have that answer off the top of my head. It's somewhere around uh, 40 some percent or uh, no it'd be more than that. It'd be somewhere around 50 some percent. Probably less than 60 though. I don't know. You need to do that on a calculator. I don't know. I don't know that one off the top of my head. Okay, we'll do a lab when you're in the room. Probably Tuesday for green, probably Thursday for gold. Now you need to have this done.